Hello, my name is Milana Leschmann and I am a former World Institute Polish Research Assistant. Thank you World Institute for inviting me to the Central European Book Series. The topic of my presentation today is Demythologizing Motherhood, a comparative reading of Polish and Canadian fiction. I would like to present my analysis of the representation of motherhood in selected texts by Canadian and Polish writers. The talk will be a study of how the myth of motherhood is deconstructed in literature and how the cultural understanding of the female role in the society evolves. Theorized by a Polish feminist scholar Agnieszka Graf, motherhood is seen as a problematic issue in the feminist studies. Being a mother means to constantly choose between self-realization and the child's well-being. It is often a life in contradiction, subjected to judgment and the feeling of ambivalence. The talk will be based on Agnieszka Graf's non-fiction book, Matka Feministka, and the selection, uh, selected fiction by Jovita Bydlowska, Drunk Mom, a memoir, and Rachel Kask, A Life's Work. It seems like motherhood had been never so politicized as in Poland of the 2020s. With the Constitutional Court's decision to restrict the abortion law even more, Polish women, along with a lot of men, decided to leave their homes and protest. The national women's strike has shown how important the issue is and how crucial it is to defend the female reproductive rights. The birth rate in Poland is decreasing, and while certain numbers might be in decline due to the COVID-19 pandemic, such trend has been also observed before 2019. It's also noted that Polish women decide to get pregnant more often while emigrating to other countries. Such statistical data allows to assume that there are substantial reasons why women in Poland are hesitant to become mothers. Motherhood is a highly mythologized yet simultaneously truly despised institution. On the one hand, the society's standards for mothers are almost impossible to satisfy. A young woman is expected to combine a professional career with a perfectly run household and childcare. A single mother is supposed to manage on her own and never complain. A mother who has a child with a disability is treated like a burden to the society. And yet, the mythologized motherhood is a sanctity. For decades of the social realism, Polish women had to cope on their own. There was no time, no means to complain. The goal was to survive and provide for the family. In certain ways, such legacy is still present. Young girls are still taught that they have to be strong. The church tells them that suffering is a blessing and that motherhood is one, the only possible calling for a real woman. In this context, the Polish feminists have neglected the topic for decades. In 2014, however, a Polish academic, Agnieszka Graf, published her book entitled Matka Feministka, A Feminist Mother, in which she makes an attempt to fill the gap and contextualize the concept of mother. It is perhaps impossible to describe motherhood in the Polish context without referring to the mythical concept of the Polish mother, Matka Polka. The Polish dictionary defines the Polish mother as, quote, a woman who has devoted her whole life to family and child upbringing in the spirit of traditional and patriotic values. It is impossible to emphasize that this myth is strongly supported by the Catholic Church which seeks the example of the Polish mother in the figure of the Virgin Mary. Hence, the Polish mother is a paragon of femininity, the effect of the historical complications which created an image of a heroic woman willing to sacrifice for her motherland and focused mainly on her family, not on herself. On top of the motherhood myth, the Catholic Church sees women entirely in the role of mothers. It is a woman's vocation, regardless of the fact whether she has actually given birth or not. A woman is a mother to all. End of story. No wonder that the church has always plagued against birth control, sexual education, or the right to abortion. Graf points out that the female reproductive rights were traded already in 1993 when the law restricted the right to abortion. And yet, the peace government decided to impose even stricter regulations in 2020, denying the right to abort a fetus with genetic defects. In this narration, 
the women lost the battle over the nomenclature as well. It is conservative, in, in the conservative discourse, the fetus became a child, a pregnant woman became a mother, and abortion became murder. The word mother and motherhood is almost entirely taken over by the conservative discourse, and the myth is stronger than ever. The reality, however, is far from being sentimental. Motherhood in Poland is still a rather lonely experience. In the neoliberal economy after the 1989 transformation, a working mother became somewhat of a pariah. Struggling to navigate the professional career with childcare, she is constantly under the scrutiny of the public eye. Earning less than men, she is required to work more. Such struggle inherently must lead to an emotional or mental crisis. Depression, the feeling of guilt and loneliness or financial struggle are just a few of them. Fiction is always a lens in which a socio-political situation is reflected. It is no different in the context of writing about motherhood and the reality of the female experience. With the worldwide success of the Netflix series adaptation of Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, the topic of female body as a battlefield, um, as a political battlefield, uh, literature stepped into the public discourse as well. Polish women fell in love with the novel in which women's reproductive rights are pushed to the extreme. The threat of a dystopia successfully instigated the collective imagination. So did other publications. North American literature has been a strong inspiration for Polish women for decades. The first translations of Betty Friedan, Adrian Rich, Susan Faludi inspired many of us to stand up and fight for change. Today, however, I would like to talk about books which are less academic and deal with issues closer to an everyday life experience and are read by a broader spectrum of women. The two novels I wish to analyze in the context of demythologizing motherhood are written by a Polish-Canadian writer, Lubita Pydlowska, and a Canadian-British author, Rachel Kask. Both texts are written in a convention of a memoir. Pydlowska tells a story of a young father's addiction to drugs and alcohol. It is difficult to say why Lubita drinks. She had been an addict prior to her experience of motherhood, but although she was sober for some time before having a baby, the postpartum period made her start drinking again. She compares herself and her thirst to a baby, constantly demanding attention, a baby who won't rest until all their needs are satisfied. I'm exactly like a baby, she says. Give it to me. Give it to me right now. My wanting is just as powerful. The narrator describes the state of motherhood as a kingdom, where the mother is the monarch. She rules over the country of little people. She is the monarch of whom it is expected that my natural instincts will overrule selfishness, helplessness, fear, alcoholism. The life of an infant caretaker is subjected to the constant feeling of guilt and the struggle to navigate between the drinking and, and caretaking. She admits that I wanted to be what he wanted me to be, a good mom, a worthy partner, a perfect ruler for the country that he had accidentally given me. This way, she also expresses her guilt for not being able to satisfy the expectations of her partner, the child's father. Such life is a series of her own failures and letdowns. At one time, she finds herself unconsciously drunk lying on the floor, but as she observes, in the picture, I look angelic, kissing the top of my baby's forehead, posing with my sunglasses perched coyly on my head. Enveloped with the overwhelming fear of losing the love and chance that life has given her, Jovita is reflecting on the moments of labor. I didn't know it at the time, but it was too much happiness. Happiness puts you at too much risk. What if you were to lose it? Too much happiness is a paradox. It's a tragedy even, getting something you always wanted, but being able, unable to keep it. And she continues, In my ongoing confusion over motherhood, I go back to replaying the moment when my son was finally out, to remind myself of that overwhelming happiness, to remind myself what I'm doing here. Jovita's experience of motherhood makes her find herself in a vicious circle. She wants to escape the reality 
therefore she dreams. Then she dreams because of her feeling of guilt and worry. She admits, Can't get sober till I feel I'm ready to face the guilt and worry. Can't face the guilt and worry when I'm sober. Simultaneously, Jovita looks for a social thing, a thing to get away from the baby, some kind of a me time. All the time, Jovita is very conscious about her drinking problem, and yet she finds ways to excuse herself. Paradoxically, the reason why she thinks she cannot be a bad person is the fact that she is a mother. In her view, or the view of the society, a man, a mom is a person unable of wrongdoing. Therefore, even while drinking, she feels that being a mother makes her less of a drunk. The same reason applies to why Jovita is reluctant to seek help. She says, I don't ask for help because I'm scared, also too proud. Admitting I am in trouble doesn't mean asking for help. It means asking to be shunned. That is why what she realizes is that even though I'd never admit it to myself, that's what it is, loneliness. Jovita imagines herself as a different person in a dreamlike vision. She is then away for a few days. This chapter is narrated in the third person narrator, by which she implies a sort of dissociation from her own self. What happens later is that this narration suddenly switches into first person when Jovita says, I'm a mom, I finally tell him, losing my disguise. The restaurant owner says there's no way I'm a mom. This way, one observes that the category of a mother changes not only her own vision of herself, but it also makes her a different person in the eyes of others. By appearing single in a bar, drinking and flirting with the restaurant owner, Jovita is no longer in a mom's role. She is not credible. In order to escape the feeling of loneliness, Jovita leaves her house with a baby in the stroller as often as possible. I stay out because I can't stay in one place, because I'm running away and because I'm chasing something too. A very similar motive is presented in a Polish author's novel entitled Jak pokochać centra handlowe, How to Fall in Love with Their Shopping Malls. Natalia Fiedorczuk describes a motherhood experience which is full of the feeling of loss. You lose your freedom, a pre-pregnancy body and your time, which becomes a luxury. The main character quickly realizes that she suffers from postpartum depression. When medication stabilizes her condition, she starts to spend time with a stroller in the malls. Before noon, these places appear as mother-friendly simulacra. A mall provides young moms with a friendly dupe of social interaction without the need to commit. According to Jovita, motherhood is an infinity of second chances. It is insanity by repetition. In the last chapter of her memoir, Jovita gives plenty of reasons which may not be the reasons at all for her drinking. She digs deep into the archaeology of her life, uncovering certain biographical moments as if layers beneath her addiction. The last stratum is her motherhood. She says, Because I held it together and told myself I will hold it together, until I give birth to this child, and then I will murder every single perpetrator, starting with myself. Because of Frankie. Because I couldn't handle all the love. Rachel Cask's book is slightly different in tone, but it is also kept in a form of a diary. Her stance of the issue of motherhood is powerful and straightforward when she says, I regarded it as a threat a form of disability that marked me out as unequal. But women must and do live with the prospect of childbirth. Some dread it, some long for it, and some manage it so successfully as to give other people the impression that they even think about it. Cass is interested in the huge discrepancy between motherhood and fatherhood as separate experiences. She comments that after a child is born, the lives of its mother and father diverge, so that where before they were living in a state of some equality, now they exist in a sort of feudal relationship to each other. For Kask, the state of motherhood is an experience of constant contradictions and ambivalent feeling, not only towards the woman's body, but perhaps primarily towards the child. In her confession, she states that birth is not merely 
that which con divides women from themselves, so that a woman's understanding of what it is to exist is profoundly changed. It is as difficult to leave your children as it is to stay with them. To discover this is to feel that your life has become irretrievably mired with conflict, or caught in some mythic snare in which you will perpetually vainly struggle. Kask describes her sense of mystery she felt about pregnancy and labor, a conspiracy almost among the women who had already gone through this experience, but were unwilling to share it with those who were still expecting. She feels as if the mother-to-be, mothers-to-be are kept in a cocoon of ignorance about what awaits them, as if the horrors of labor was too hard to tell and something that would scare them to death. In this way, according to Kask, a pregnant woman is seen almost exclusively as a future mother, while herself is no longer separate. She describes this in the following manner. My sex has become an exiguous, long-legged, lovingly furnished trap into which I have inadvertently wandered and from which now there is no escape. I have been tagged as if electronically by pregnancy. My womanly movements are being closely monitored. She tells the story of Emma, a fictional character from a pregnancy guidebook, in which Emma is a typical, mythical mother-to-be, bloomingly excited and positively motivated. However, herself as a reader and a woman expecting a child, feels overwhelmed and scared by the image constructed by the authors of that self-help book. The confrontation with that image appears to be counterproductive to, to her, and she remarks that it might be harmful to women who feel tired, unfit, and full of awe, while comparing their own attitude with Emma, the perfect mother who has it all. Kask examines the political aspects of the female body when it comes to motherhood. I read newspaper reports of women in America being prosecuted for harming their unborn fetuses, and wonder how this can be, how the body can become a public space, like a telephone box, that can unlawfully vandalize itself. itself. When it comes to labor, Kask describes her C-section as a very medical procedure. She enumerates a number of medical activities, herself being detached from everything that goes on with her body. She loses her agency. She is objectified. She said, for in truth, my experience of birth was more like the experience of having an appendix removed than what most people would understand by labor. Such objectification of the female body evokes numerous questions about identity. The struggle to combine the role of a mother with everything else that the woman used to be, pri uh, used to be prior to motherhood proves to be a constant fight not only with the expectations of the family and the society, but nonetheless with the woman's own perception of herself. Kask says, to be a mother, I must leave the telephone unanswered, work undone, arrangements unmet. To be myself, I must let the baby cry, must forestall her hunger or leave her for evenings out, must forget her in order to think about other things. To succeed in being one, means to fail at being the other. By the same token, according to Kask, the question of what a woman is, if she is not a mother, has been su superseded, uh, for me, that of what a woman is, if she is a mother, and of what a mother, in fact, is. Kask is hence trying to define her new self as a mom. She waits for the baby to fall asleep, as there are only the moments to reflect upon herself. She constantly seeks for freedom, for being able to find her former self. It is a constant fight for moments of tranquility. When the baby has colic, the mother is expected to think back over what you've eaten and drunk over the past 24 hours. The body of a mother is not hers, also after she gives birth. The narrator, sleep-deprived and helpless, is afraid of love's limit and more certain that they exist. Finally, let me take a look at some examples of readers' response toward these texts. Both Budlovska's and Kask's novels evoked an emotional reaction. Kask herself quotes one critic's review in The Guardian, which said, 
if everyone were to read this book, it said the propagation of the human race would virtually cease, which would be a shame. Or another one, pure misery to read. From the way she writes about her first child, God alone only knows how she allowed herself to bear a second. It is worth noting that the critics who express these concerns are women. But Lovska's book received ambiguous response. Written a few years later, it definitely scored more unjudgmental opinions, and yet, for a number of readers, it was shocking to digest a memoir of a woman alcoholic who is a mother. The myth of motherhood is still very strong in Finn. The expectations of many do not allow for a mother to fall, nor is she forgiven for resenting the role she finds herself in. Regardless from the geographical setting, we want to believe that perfect mothers exist, monumental figures who know it all, who protect, sacrifice, and care. In conclusion, I would like to turn to Agnieszka Graf once more, who emphasizes the enormous loneliness of a mother. She states that the ideology of a true womanhood, which is in an inherent consequence of motherhood, takes away the women's freedom. The fact that women have and love their children contributes to what they are allowed and not allowed to do in the public sphere. Is it, an, it is an ongoing blackmail under the disguise of a sincere care. Are you dreaming of equality? And have you thought about your kids? The figure of a mother who chose her career and the image of a sad child who misses her, these are the key tropes of an anti-equality rhetoric. They are used frequently because they have a huge power. They are paralyzing. The sentimentalized ideology of motherhood as the woman's only calling is pushing away the social policy and tech. It seems to be crucial then to finally include men in the process of childcare. It is time to step aside and exercise that fatherhood is not just about the rights, but it's equally about the duties. Thank you very much for your attention.